Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 126. This might actually be the most important topic that we have covered on this podcast. Um, we're gonna talk about navigating the college recruiting process, the youth baseball development scene, um, really everything that kids and parents really need to know as they work their way from age nine all the way up through college baseball. Um, something that's really underrepresented, um, unfortunately, in, in a lot of the, the content that's out there around the baseball scene. And we've got a great guest that absolutely exudes passion passion is, is one of the best you could possibly imagine to speak to all these different components of long-term success because he's done it as a baseball dad and as a baseball coach as well as a, a consultant kind of in the college space um, just someone who, who really has a great handle on what's going on and you know we, we dig into the you know the, the the good and the bad of the industry and and I think it's important that, that parents and kids be aware of what's out there and hopefully shed some great light on this um, in this episode so I think you're gonna really like it Overuse injuries have emerged as one of the biggest threats to players at every level of competition. As an example, at the professional level, ulnar collateral ligament injuries at the elbow alone sideline pitchers for an average of over 17 months. That's a ton of lost development and a threat to lengthy careers. Just as concerningly though, for youth players, overuse is the predominant mechanism of injury. So what can be done? Obviously, we need to train athletes to be prepared for all the stresses the game throws at them. However, the other side of the equation, recovery, often doesn't get the attention it deserves. Healthy, recovered arms mean you can stay in the game and give your best on the field, and that's where Mark Pro comes in. Mark Pro is a cutting-edge recovery tool that provides all the benefits of active recovery, but without the extra effort, muscular fatigue, or stress to tendons and joints. Players can use Mark Pro as long as needed for exceptional recovery between training sessions or after games. We'll often send Mark Pro units back with athletes to their hotels or even have them use them on team flights. Both easy to use and portable, Mark Pro is a powerful tool that allows recovery anywhere, anytime. Use it while relaxing at home, on the road, or during tournaments. On a personal note, I was originally a naysayer when it came to Mark Pro. However, longtime Cressy Sports Performance athlete Corey Kluber turned me on to it. He adopted Mark Pro into his post-pitching recovery approach, and it was an integral part of him going out and throwing 200 innings year after year. This led me to experiment with it myself and with more of our athletes, and the feedback was consistently outstanding. Now, just a few years later, you'll see it in every major league organization as part of the routines of some of the most accomplished baseball players on the planet. If you're looking for the same results enjoyed by these athletes, visit markpro.com and use the coupon code CRESSY at checkout for an exclusive discount. Again, that's markpro.com, M-A-R-C-P-R-O.com, and use the coupon code CRESSY, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, at checkout for an exclusive discount. Today's guest grew up in Massachusetts and received a baseball scholarship from Arizona State University. He was drafted out of high school in the 13th round in 1981 by the Chicago Cubs and opted to start his professional career instead. Eventually, he found his way into coaching, where he led several teams at the high school, American Legion, National Travel Baseball, and NCAA levels. He's also worked as a task force member for the prestigious Team USA program in Cary, North Carolina. His two sons, Kyle and Tyler, both played college baseball. Tyler, a previous podcast guest, won a national championship at Vanderbilt and is currently in the major leagues with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Tyler also holds the distinction of being the only New England player in MLB draft history to be a two-time first-round selection. Following his experience as a player, evaluator, head coach, and parent, our guest has now turned his attention to helping families navigate baseball development, the travel ball scene, and the college recruiting process. Please welcome to the show, Walter Beaton. Walter, thank you so much for, uh, for joining the show. This is long overdue. <laughs> well, I am, uh, I am honored to, uh, to be with you this evening, Eric. Uh, I am grateful for all of the things that uh, you and I have been able to share since 2008. Absolutely. And so just for the record, this is going to be episode 126. I believe that um, that Tyler was episode, I want to say 123. So I think that makes you guys the, the Griffey family of the Elite Baseball <laughs> podcast. This is the first father-son tandem to ever uh, forever join the show. And I, I think it's a, it's an awesome progression just because you, you heard, you know, Ty's, you know, kind of um, the course of his career and the lessons he's learned and stuff like that. And I think it's, it's cool to follow up with, um, you know, the, the story from dad, you know, who was also coach and, you know, mentor and things like that. So I think we're in for some, some really cool conversation here. Well, anytime I can be mentioned in the same family <laughs> history as the Griffies, and hopefully I can do as well 
uh, as my man Tyler did. Uh, he absolutely knocked it out of the park. Yeah, he crushed it. All right, so let's let's talk about the journey that brought you to this day. Because if you ask anybody, you know, in our circle who has interacted with you in the lobby of CSP or at a baseball game, the the line that comes out always is passion. You know, and, and your, your your Twitter handle is is baseball lifer. Um, that's not something you just grab because it was available. You definitely earned it. So, um, you know, and, and, and Tim Corbin even raved about this and actually in the forward to your book. And it was it was spot on when I read it. You know, let's touch on talk, touch on the history of your experience with baseball, you know, both as a player yourself, um, as well as as a coach and as a parent, you know, how it shaped to where you are today and and, and the way in which you're, you know, you're giving back to the baseball community now. Sure. Well, I was fortunate that I grew up in a what I would call a baseball hotbed, um, really an athletic hotbed, youth uh, athletic hotbed in the city of Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, and I did not find my way to uh, to baseball until the age of nine. Um, and so, you know, I learned at a very young age what it felt like to get cut and uh, be disappointed. Um, you know, and so I learned that if I was going to be uh, a baseball player or an athlete of any kind, that it was up to me uh, to get better uh, and to work at it. And so, you know, baseball lifer. Um, my mom died when I was six. My dad died when I was 16. I lived on my own, had my own apartment while I was in high school. Um, you know, and I wasn't a drinker, didn't do drugs. And my passion was baseball. And so, you know, that was something that I always felt that I always needed to have in my life. And I was probably the worst player in the city of Lynn in the ninth, you know, I was probably like nine years old to say 15 years old. And then between the age of 15 and 18, uh, my dad, before he passed away, we relocated to Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Uh, when it was all said and done, you know, I was able to be uh, a recruitable college student athlete at Arizona State and Coach Brock, which back in the day, the Pac-10, Pac as it was referred to then, uh, was probably the equivalent of what the SEC is today. You know, had Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire. Randy Johnson, you know, Terry Francona at Arizona. Um, and then I was drafted by the Chicago Cubs out of high school. Um, and, you know, what a lot of people don't realize, you go into Wikipedia, you, you look up statistics. But when I got drafted on the same day as the draft was the sale of the Chicago Cubs from the Wrigley family to the Chicago Tribune. And unbeknownst to me, everybody associated with the Wrigley family, the executives, the front office, the coaches, the scouts, everybody. And as I ultimately learned, the players uh, from that draft were, were wiped off the face of the earth, literally and figuratively, uh, after 1981. So I got a taste of, hey, baseball is a business. You might be pretty good, but, you know, it's a business, nothing personal. And so, you know, at a ripe old age of 19 years old, I had my own world I had to survive in. Um, you know, I couldn't go to college because I didn't have the money. Uh, I was not allowed to get a scholarship any longer because I had signed a professional contract, which in those days was ironclad. So I really didn't have any other options other than to play, you know, local leagues around here in the, the North Shore in central Massachusetts, get a job, uh, live life. I began to, you know, do some odd coaching jobs. I still aspired to play professionally. I had an opportunity to go back and play with the, Chicago, the St. Louis Cardinals. But by that time, I was 25 years old and um, was really about to get married um, and, you know, raise a family. And so, you know, being a minor leaguer, as you are well aware of, it really doesn't pay the bills. So I just stuck and started my call my coaching career, uh, started coaching high schools, uh, American Legion, which was all the rage back in the day of dinosaurs and, you know, uh, us old ball players. That's kind of how we made our bones was American Legion uh, and built up an, a resume to the point where I was able to get uh, an opportunity to coach at the NCAA Division three level at Becker College. Um, and so that's my baseball background. That's why I'm so passionate about it because I can relate 
to the grinders and the people that have to survive and that have a, a passion for the sport and they don't want to quit until the uniform gets ripped off of them. Uh, I played until the age of 38, 39. And then, you know, I watched the boys play. Uh, so that was my baseball background and my coaching background. And ultimately, probably when Kyle and Tyler were 10 and eight is kind of when I started to watch more of their games and play less and coach less. Yeah. And I mean, your, your kids very much grew up around the game. I mean, they were, they were obviously at practice with you and I know they, they were both, were they bat boys with the Worcester tornadoes? They were, they were kind of involved. Right. There oh as yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They grew up in it. So, you know, I'm curious, like, you know, you talked about making the shift from, from coaching to, you know, being a spectator for the boys and, and obviously coaching them on the side. Like as you got to the teenage years, like, did you start to see, for lack of a better term, just like a need for direction for parents? Like you obviously knew this world, incredibly well um and i and i you know I, I remember back to like our you know some of our first interactions is that you were you were very humble about you know Ty, tyler's you know future you know and, and I, I remember distinctly it was all about you know the goal was to become a college baseball player um that you know that baseball was a path to an education and you know we started up in, in sophomore year of high school there was there was no talk of being drafted or you know playing profession or anything that I, I thought at the time that you had a really good head on your shoulders just in terms of um, you know, what the appropriate timeline, what the, what the next step was, did, did you recognize that maybe in the moment then that that was, that was something that was really sorely lacking in the industry? Uh, I absolutely, without a doubt, remember thinking, why aren't more parents aware of what is ahead? And they're all running in different directions, trying to chase something that was unattainable uh and i really thought the lack of information and this is way before travel ball i mean heck the, the original travel organization was called the south shore sea dogs um back in i want to say 05 2004 2005 and i remember parents telling me that they were driving four hours to play double headers I kept thinking to myself, geez, you know, that's not really the route you want to go. And really, there needs to be some sort of a educational process. Uh, and I remember, and here's where the, the ties of Cressy, I, that's what I call it. I call it the TC effect, the ties of Cressy. When the boys were, Tyler was 11 and Kyle was 13. And we, there was a fall baseball game. And this team called and said, hey, could we, your boys come? We're, we're short a couple players. And we're playing Worcester Volk. <laughs> sure. So we show up and, you know, uh, there's this kid on the mound, little lefty. And I'm watching him throw. And I'm saying to myself, there's no way this guy's going to put Tyler up. I mean, Kyle, he's got to he's, he's step in. He's 13. He's on the big diamond. But you're not going to put Tyler against this kid. And, and I remember other parents saying to me, well, you're going to say something? I, I, no, no, they'll figure it out. And if he has to do it, he's, he'll figure it out. At least he'll know what it looks like. But my point was, the boys, unbeknownst to me, had learned so much because of all of the college practices that they had been at. So to them, it didn't look anything different. It looked as if it was just one of my college guys, you know, the Reno brothers or... Corey Shepard. And so they didn't have any fear. They had seen it already, which I think is something that we, we miss out. We, we, we see a lot of, or we read a lot of things on social media about the blueprint, how to follow the script to get to the college level. But in reality, the best thing that we can do as parents is to let our children actually see it, feel it, touch it. Um, more is don't be intimidated by it. The line is right. the exactly. Line. Yeah, I, lo I love right. that from the parenting yeah. standpoint for everything. Right. And so that's what it really was. And I saw an opportunity to kind of share, you know, some things that I had learned during my journey, as well as, you know, heck, I knew Corbs when his roommate was Rich Vaccarello at Ohio Wesleyan. So I had a lot of friends that were coaching college, coaching professionally, scouting which was a curse and a blessing at the same time, but it definitely helped me as far as a parent to help navigate the, the, both my boys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, talk to me maybe about, 
you know, Kyle and, and Tyler both had, had different timelines in terms of like their recruiting process, you know, and we, we had Ty on, but maybe speak to his progressions, um, you know, over the course of time, obviously I, I got to know him fall of his sophomore year and, um, you know, what did you learn over those, those couple of years, um, you know, speak to maybe what, what you guys encountered, you know, really from what, 2008 to 2011. Right. Yeah. So really, and it, I think it's important to, uh, to correct that because yeah. I had a parent listen to your interview with Tyler and he said to me, I thought you told me that Tyler started his, his freshman year. I said, well, he did. And, and, and the reason why that's relevant is I get a lot of parents who will try to tell me that I don't want to have my son working out or lifting weights when they're 13 or 14, you know, too, too, too young, uh, not ready, uh, you know, can get hurt. And, and I tell parents all the time when Tyler was, and he was young, as you know, not many people knew that, but Tyler graduated high school at 17 years old. Um, and when he was 13, he came to you as a freshman during football season yeah. at Auburn high school. Now in hindsight, it's crazy because Tyler couldn't even lift his arm. But <laughs> my point is, is that it was the right time because at those ages, he needed to gain an awareness of his body in the role that strength uh, would play as an athlete. He also needed to learn the routines and the structures and the disciplines. And that's kind of the really the fork in the road that I, I would say about 80% of student athletes follow, you know, what my oldest son followed, which is, you know what, yeah, I'm good. I like it, but I don't really love it to the point where I want to spend every day, you know, preparing for baseball. I want to play basketball. I want to hang with my buddies. I want to go to the beach, et cetera. Whereas Tyler, at a very young age, was, yeah, oh, yeah, let's go during football season. I won't lift with the football team. I want to get better at baseball, and I love it, you know. And he just embraced it from the minute that I took him. And a lot of it had to do with his summer prior to meeting you. That was his first summer playing travel baseball. So at 14 years old was the first time that he played any travel baseball. And he played one inning, an inning and a third. And we had traveled and I drove Black Betty, the, the, the Prius that I had, <laughs> down to Georgia. And his team won the mythical national championship and everybody's hooting and hollering. But he got to look around. He was hanging out with guys that had committed to South Carolina and North Carolina and Florida and all these great schools uh, and all these nationally ranked guys. And he got one and a third innings. I expected him to get in the car and say, you know, something like that stunk. You know, we drove all the way down here and you had to spend all that money. He got in the car and he said, I know what it looks like. And it was, it was a rocky moment. And so from that moment on, I knew, you know, that that was his, choice his decision he sought out hey let's ask rich gedman who was the manager of the wister tornadoes um you know who i should go to and it was this guy at holy cross flynn or it was this new young guy eric cressy who's down in hudson uh, and i'm like well holy cross is you know right up the driveway from my house i can just walk him there but well, let me take a ride down and meet this you know eric guy and then i meet pistol and all the other guys and <laughs> Um, you know, the rest is history. But my point is, is that every single parent at 13 to 15 needs to understand that those three years are the critical years. They are the critical years on a number of different levels. And we think that we just have to wait until they get to high school. But in reality, the real work is done during that three year time period of, you know, 13. So let's say seventh through uh, ninth grade. I have a, so I have an interesting one for you. So we, we obviously speak to in the context of, you know, physical development, things like that. I actually have an, an email that you sent to me on March 8th after Tyler's first off season. And I think it's actually an amazingly important element of context for, for some of the parents that are listening. I'm going to read it. It says, dear Eric, I wanted to take a minute to send along a sincere and heartfelt appreciation for all you and Pete have done for Tyler. He truly looks up to you guys and all the guys there that work out in no way did I ever think Ty would get into his workouts as much as he has. 
Tyler's been going through a tough time and I thought I would share it with you. Many of his peers have begun to do teenage stuff, beer, dip, chew, etc. Ty was very close to all these kids all his life. He's made the choice not to hang around these kids when they're doing this stuff. I'm proud of the decisions he's making in his life. Your facility has become a sanctuary for him. I think Sahil, who is an, another podcast guest and a, a Twitter sensation, <laughs> has become a role model for Ty. I feel that with your continued help and guidance, Tyler's dream of playing college baseball will come to fruition. Again, Eric, you've exceeded all of our expectations with respect to Tyler. He's become a better young man, both physically and internally. The staff, as well as participants, are all first-class people, and I cannot be happier. Thank you, Walter. So when, when I hear that, what I there, there's a million lessons to really glean from it. The first couple that I think is his dream of playing college baseball will come to fruition. And we see so many people that look past that. You know, it was never his dream of playing Division I baseball, his dream of being an Ivy League student. It was, it was keep it necessarily broad so that we can we can cast the net that's appropriate for for who he is and then the second thing i i i come from is like it's it's the third place right you have home you have school and then there has to be a third place it can be a place where you know you're you're working towards a goal that's important to you and you're surrounded by good people or it can be you know that place where friends are doing things they shouldn't be doing right and then i think the last one it's the people like i you know i saw it saw hill take tyler under his wing similar to how, you know, some of our pro guys took Sahil under their wing. And I, I just think the people that you hang out with in that timeline are, are so important. And, and over the years with our facility, I think, you know, for every parent that wants to like read our website or check out an article I've given or something like that, um, I think we see just as many parents that want to come by the facility and, you know, see how we carry ourselves just because they know that their, their 15 year olds are, are impressionable, you know, at a, it's a crucial time in their life and they want to make sure that they're surrounded by the right people. So I mean, the lesson for me from like that letter is that development is is very multifaceted, right? It's very easy to get focused on like learning a curveball or putting on 15 pounds or something like that. But it's it's even more about understanding what you always talk about. It's the it's the process and and who you go through while you're doing it. Well, I am extremely passionate on this topic, and as you are well aware of, as I give myself a pat on the back, I've probably <laughs> walked a hundred parents through Cressy and every parent that I've walked through when we leave the same takeaway. They, they're just blown away at the, the overall atmosphere. And when I talk with parents, I say, you know, as a baseball parent, we hear about velocity and exit speed and spin rates and arm care and all of this stuff. But what we miss is exactly what that email uh, was directed towards you. It's those people that we choose as parents to put into our child's life. They are important forks in our in our child's road. And, and all of our children make these decisions that we never see, we never hear about. And the social expectations, the narrative of, you know, you have to be successful uh, you have a bullseye on your back every day as a teenager now. You have social media. We have cameras on our phones. And so every day, you know, the decisions that we make ultimately are who we become. And what I noticed very quickly was Tyler was, was talking and interacting with Tim College, Tim Collins and Chad and, and, and Sawhill. Uh, Kurt Schilling, Kevin Euclid, um, uh, Sean Haviland, uh, you know, and all of these people that, you know, Tyler would come home and say, it's okay for me to want this. It's okay for me to make the decisions that I'm making. It's okay to be different. And for every person that was telling Tyler, what do you think you're too good for us? What do you think you can't hang out with us anymore? You think you're going to be a, a college player or a major league player? Tyler never said that anything other than I choose to make my body the best that it can be. And every decision that I make when I wake up, when I'm in after school. And so there's so many forks in a, in a teenager's world that as parents, now, I was aware of this because of my coaching and my interactions with, you know, as a recruiting, you know, I would go out and recruit and I would listen to stories. And so as I began to see my boys grow up uh, in a social media world, 
I became more aware and, and cognizant of, of who was in their lives uh, and who I was trying to surround them with. And this, the absolute best way I can describe it as far as when a parent says to me, ah, oh, this Cressy performance, wow, I, you know, it's a lot. And I said, well, listen, I used to have to drive from Boston to Lawrence Academy to bring them to, to Hudson, Mass, to bring them back to Lawrence Academy to drive to Auburn, Mass. I said, and there were days where I'd have to have him there for an extra hour or two. It was the best place for him to grow up. I said, because that's exactly what's happening at a facility like Cressy Performance. Your teenagers are seeing their futures, what it's going to take for them to grow up, to be prepared to be that college student. So it's an integral part, mentally, physically, academically, socially that 13 to 18 year old time frame that we kind of discount with how many travel teams and showcases and camps and all spend your time getting stronger, getting healthier, being prepared to be able to compete when your feet hit, whether it's a high school campus or a college campus. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it was also interesting because, you know, Tyler's path, I think from the outside looked very linear but there were, you know, it's like that, that graph of like squiggly lines that go in all different directions. And there's, there's an upward trend when you look back on it, but you, you go through these kind of learning periods of, all right, he, you know, he went on the road for a couple of weeks, lost a couple of pounds, comes home, gets some home cooking, sleeps in his own bed. And then there's the recharge. Um, you know, like, what are the things that you think were the most impactful? Obviously we spoke to like, you know, the building strength and putting on some body weight and things like that. But I mean, there were also things that you do with type teaching the change up at a young age. You know, what were the things that when you look back on it were the most impactful as dad slash coach that, that helped him to become a first rounder out of high school at, at age 17? Be an athlete. Yeah. He was never a 24, seven, 365 baseball player. In fact, you know, much to the dismay of his mother and probably a lot of coaches, Tyler on August 1st was a football player. Mm -hmm. And on August 1st, he put a baseball down and he never touched a baseball, probably until mid to late December or even in some cases early January. And then he was playing basketball up and through his uh, sophomore year in high school. Um, and then he had his baseball. But he also was a hockey guy. He was a soccer guy. Of all, both my boys played all the sports until they decided it wasn't any fun anymore. Um, you know, and, and the number one thing that I can say with regard to Tyler was he was always throwing, whether it was a football, a softball, a wiffle ball, a baseball. It, it, it wasn't, hey, put don't throw that number of pitches. Or He threw, but he didn't pitch. He played, but he didn't compete. And I think that's a big part of the foundation that many parents have this mindset of the more I play, the better I get. Well, if it's in a competitive landscape, you can't control your repetitions. But if you're letting them go out and play, they get their repetitions and we don't even have to worry about it. meaning they're going to swing at a wiffle ball a hundred times. You know, they're going to throw a tennis ball or a wiffle ball. Uh, and they're going to learn, uh, you know, how to be creative and what they're thinking about how to how to throw to different spots. The other thing about the change up, I get asked this all the time. If you go on social media, especially on the, with the Twitter baseball police. Uh, oh, little boys don't have enough arm speed to throw a change up. It's so stupid to do that. OK, it's a field pitch that 90 percent of pitchers do not ever have until they get to either elite high level college or professional. It's a pitch that everybody's hands are different. Everybody, how they feel when they choke down or, or kind of lighten the grip. But it's a pitch that you need to have as a pitcher. And I always tell parents, the more arrows that you put in your son's quiver, the more competitive he has the ability to be. He always has something in that he can pull out that somebody else may not be aware of. So a changeup for Tyler, he learned that by throwing a softball and by throwing a football end over end. And so he just got creative with it. It wasn't like, okay, we're going to throw a changeup in, in a game 0-2. No, he just learned, like, I like it. My hands are bigger. I like holding it this way. 
And when the time came, you, anybody can learn how to throw a curveball. I, I took a tennis ball can and I told them the tennis ball can is going to be taped. And until you show me, you can throw that tennis ball can end over end so that it doesn't look like a helicopter. Once I see the, the, the tennis ball can going end over end, we'll begin to put a, a baseball in your hand. And then I put tape on a baseball and made sure that the tape was going, you know, end over end and not sideways. So really Tyler had three pitches, you know, probably by the age of 14, but he didn't throw hard. And that was the biggest knock on Tyler. I would say right up until his junior year in high school, as you know, he got cut from team USA because, you know, he had, I think he had like 23 strikeouts in 14 innings, but, he was 89, 91, and they had guys that were 91, 95, uh, and they threw harder. But he never th threw harder until he came home, you know, after that event in, uh, in Cary. You know, the other one I would add, too, and, and I don't know when the age was that it kicked in, but, I mean, I just remember watching um, his, his senior year, watching him and Matt Blake and John Gorman, and there were just some electric cash play sessions. I mean, there was never a wasted throw between those guys. Obviously, Gorman was drafted by the Red Sox and, and played up to I think double A with the with the A's after after being at Boston College. And and we know Blake's doing doing great in his current role. But they just there was such an awareness of high school guys um, being able to never waste throws. I mean, you see, I saw that Mike King at a really young age. Certain guys that just understand how to manipulate the baseball at the highest level. They seem to have just taken a lot more pride in catch play. Um, at a young age, had that conversation with Adam Ottavino on a previous podcast. Like, I mean, I don't know if that's just being around more mature players over an extended period of time and, and taking notice, or if it was something that, you know, may, you, maybe you actually really hammered home with them. It seems like oh. thro throwing was very fun in other ways, right? Throw different implements, footballs, things like that. Keep it, you know, engaging. But at the same time, you got to lock it in when it's a five ounce baseball in your hand. Well, I will tell you the greatest story of all time and where that came from. So I used to tell both the boys, if you're coming to my practice and you want to watch, that's fine. But if you intend to put a glove on, I have told every single player that they're going to be playing catch. How we play catch, once we're loose, we're full throttle. We are letting it loose. So Corey Shepard is not going to underhand the ball to you. You know, Keith and Kevin Reno are not going to just lob the ball to you. If you're prepared to play catch and you put a glove on, you're going to throw it like you mean it to the spot you're trying to throw it to. And so all my college guys would be like, coach, you can't do that. I said, if they put a glove on, they're, they're old enough. They're, you know, at the time, Tyler was nine uh, and, and Kyle was 11. And then and I think I stopped coaching when Tyler was 11 and hit his first home run over a fence and I missed it. Um, but the boys knew when it's time to play catch, when we stretch and we get loose, we start to prepare for practice. They're going to cut it loose. So Tyler learned at a very young age, when we are playing catch, we're moving our feet. We're centering the ball. The ball is to be thrown at game speed. You don't have a switch to flip. And so he picked up on that. Kyle picked up on that. Kyle had an absolute cannon. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he could throw a bowling ball from home to second mm -hmm. base on a string, but that's because of how they practiced, you know, with, with our, with our college guys. As you, we've talked about the things that have worked well, and, you know, we've kind of honed in on the baseball dad component. I think it'll be, be cool to go into kind of the advisory role, but you know, what were the mistakes that you made, um, you know, looking back, like these were obviously key entities that, that contributed to success. Where, where would you have done things differently? First of all, I didn't enjoy the journey. Um, I want, I, I should have uh, enjoyed the journey a lot more than I did. I think I was too much college coach, too plugged in uh, and not, I, I should have turned all that off and just been dad um, more. Uh, I, I think if I could go back and I could change, uh, I would have just put sunglasses on, sat out in center field, brought my seeds, put my AirPods on or my headphones on and just watched. And then when either boys got in the car, I would have just said, you know, what did you have fun? Or what did you learn? Because results are, are they're just meaningless. It's the memories, uh, the camaraderie, the moments, 
you know, both boys were part of a state championship in high school on the same team. That was just amazing. Um, Tyler elected to go and, and go to a, a higher level school. And I was trying to keep up with the, you know, the, the people who sent their children to these $80,000 schools. And, you know, I'm driving a Prius and, you know, delivering, you know, owning a courier business. And I was so consumed with trying to be someone in something that I wasn't, that I wasn't enjoying, you know, the whole process in its entirety. And, and the biggest thing is, is I tell parents now, you have one decade to be a kid, you know, and that decade is age 12 to 22, you know, and during those 10 years, your sons are going to make silly decisions. They're going to fall. They're going to fail. And those 10 years, you can never recreate. You can never get back. I, I, can, I can get back time with my 28-year-old, now 29-year-old son and my 31-year-old son. You know, we can plan another visit. We can have a party, we can have a function, we can play catch, but they're adults. And so we're so worried as a society about the destination, the validation that we're not stopping and enjoying the process of being a parent during what ends up being the most meaningful time in our children's lives. Well said, incredibly well said. Um, you touched on travel ball, you know, a little bit earlier, and I know we've had some spirited discussions about, gosh, where it's gone o over the years. It, it's certainly changed a lot since, you know, since we met up in, you know, 2007, 2008, um, you know, some for the better and some for the worse, right? You know, there's, if you're a good player, like there's more opportunities than ever to face other good competition that you might never see. Um, it, it certainly has, you know, in some ways elevated, you know, the quality of play, but there's also, it's come with a lot of strings attached. What do you like and what do you dislike about where travel ball, you know, has, has progressed and where it's going? Well, I think at its core, when it first started, the premise was correct. The premise was, I want to make sure that those student athletes that have a passion for the game and want to learn the game at an accelerated manner, can be surrounded by similar minded, similar uh, skill set caliber players. And it was really a tryout and only the best made the teams. It has transgressed into everybody can start an elite national prospect team, USA team, uh, you know, sponsored by, you know, you name it, where we're sponsored by approved by um it's too watered down i had a great chat and you know you know the, all the coaches that i interact with on a regular basis tim corbin is a friend he's a friend and you know he'll say things to me and it takes me a while to listen to them meaning when he talks it fills my brain and then i kind of just let it resonate for a period of time he said something to me he said you know Walt he said I get a lot of very talented baseball players he said and I love teaching instructing about the game he said but I spend more time teaching how to be part of a team than how to be a baseball player he says and, and that's a problem I shouldn't be teaching community I shouldn't be teaching roles and and your role on a team and, and how to be the best at your role and you know he often talks about most student athletes will become parents they'll have jobs they'll be part of a corporate entity and they have to be a role player they have to be a spouse they have to be a parent travel baseball is now you're a gun for hire yeah you know, and I get a, I get an absolute kick. There are, there are people who used to tell me, you're not loyal. You, you, you know, you took your son and you wouldn't come to our program. And, but yet they, they make it sound as if Tyler played for them 
for 10 years and that they created them. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to, we want to put our thumbprints all over student athletes, but how hard is it to call a kid, you play a team and their shortstop's really good. And that team is, you know, 10 and 20. And my, my team is 20 and 10. Hey, listen, you don't want to play for them. You want to play for me. We get kids drafted. We get kids to division one, come play with us. Let me talk to your dad. Hey dad, you don't have to pay us any money, but what they're doing is paying for promotion. Yeah. They're not charging your son a fee to play, but what they're doing is they're going to put they, your son is going to become a poster child and he's going to be all over their website with his photo saying we're family, this, and, you know, love for life. And, you know, this team for life. And it's a joke. Mm-hmm. And, and there's nothing that a travel team can do for your son. If your son doesn't have the skill sets to play at the next level, you know, and for every Vanderbilt student athlete, there's an Eastern Connecticut or a Yukon or a San Jacinto or a Chipola or an Indian River. Uh, for every, you know, ACC, SEC, Pac-12, Big 12 type school, there's an NAIA school that Lance Zawatsky is going to come out of and he's going to be a major league player. And so we're told the narrative is we have the blueprint. We know the script join us, we'll get you to where you want to go. And that is a stone cold lie. Your son. It's worse than it's ever been too. Oh, ever. And it's so competitive and it's so, you just, you know, the malaise on social media that parents have to navigate through and it's only getting worse. Um, And so if I could use a cliche from the late nineties where you had to stop the insanity. And that's exactly what it's become. It's become insanity. It's just insane for me to, to, to deal with a parent whose son has been paying $8,500 a year for four years to be loyal to a program and then get to a point, oh, you'll never play at that level. Oh, you won't play at that level. Well, you told me when my son was 14 that he, he was, well, you know, it just didn't pan out. You have no recourse. You can't go back in time. You're not going to get a refund. Your son isn't going to suddenly become a better baseball player. So to me, the business model of travel baseball is not a development model for college baseball. We tell parents that their sons have to go 8U, 9U, 10U, 12U. That's not how it looks in high school. It's certainly not how it looks in, at the college level or, more importantly, the professional level. And oh, by the way, the Latin players that are absolutely the stars at the major league level, they came into the game at 16, 17, 18 years old. They were competing against not their peers. They were competing against players four, five, eight years older than them since they were probably 12. But yet our model is you must maintain 11U, 12U, 13U, 14U. For what purpose? It's only a business model. It's a business model that is ruining the sport of baseball. That's it, period. End of story. I first saw it probably 2010. I remember distinctly, wonderful kid, committed to a program. Um, you know, parent obviously paid up front for the whole summer. Kid went on a three-week trip to, to Georgia and threw two innings and came back. And I mean, parents were furious just didn't get any any time whatsoever. And, and come to find out, basically, um, they had taken full pay from a bunch of parents and they, they had used those resources in order to scholarship several big names from the country. So, you know, they brought in a bunch of guys who are good players to, to play for this team. They ate up a bunch of the innings that, that should have been shared amongst the you know participants. And those players played a couple terms. They never received any development. They were just guns for hire, like you imagined, or like you commented. And now those, those players that were brought in to play for free are all over the website. We produce this talent, this, that, and the other. And meanwhile, you know, that what's not featured on the website is the, the long history of shattered relationships of people who, who didn't even get coached after they paid for a roster spot. Um, it's, a, it's a very broken model. And I, I guess my question for you then is, you know, what's a parent to do? Right. So, you know, they have a a 13, 14 year old 
um, you know, what are the questions that you ask when you look at, you know, where, what programs do we send these guys to? What's the, what's the avenue, particularly when we're talking about like a, a, a good player, right? What happens when a player commits at age 16 and they, they want to face good competition, but they want to keep developing in, in the years that follow. What are the questions you ask? The, the number one thing I try to tell parents, the sooner that you have your sons competing against older players, the better prepared they'll be when they get to high school and potentially college. The longer you delay that process, your son's growth as a baseball player is going to be stagnated. And in some cases, you're going to see a regression. And if, if parents ask me, and I get lots of parents that will call, I get a lot of direct messages, and I answer every single one with almost the same response. Critical years are 13 to 15. That's the biggest fork in the road. The biggest thing you should be doing is keeping your baseball local. Your skill set development should be daily, a routine, and your strength and conditioning should be first and foremost with your nutrition, your hydration, and your sleep. When your son is in the eighth grade, about to enter the ninth grade, you need to be playing against 17 and 18 year olds, whether that is Babe Ruth, whether that is travel baseball, whatever vehicle that allows you the ability to not play at the 15 U level, you should be playing against 16, 17 and 18 year olds collectively. You should see velocity, you should see bat speed, you should see power. You need to see it, you need to hear it, you need to feel it. And the sooner that you allow your sons to do that, if you recognize travel baseball for the business and how much money is being spent, why do we need lessons if we're paying so much money to be part of a coaching staff that is elite? Why do, we have, to, why do I have to pay for pitching lessons, hitting lessons? What's the purpose of that? We should have coaching that is talking to players, working with players. We should have mentors. You know how easy it is for a 14 to 15 year old, go to a high school practice, find an 18 year old and say, hey, do you mind if I, can you teach me how to do this? Or can you work with me? There's very inexpensive, simple ways to go about the sport of baseball. Again, Latin players, I, you know, weighted baseballs. Now we've gone on this topic many, many years, but way back in the day, I had a kid from uh, Puerto Rico that played I played with in the minor leagues and he threw a ball at me it was a softball it had nails all pounded in it the thing weighed like a brick that was his weighted baseball my other buddy had a tuna fish can and he would he would roll golf balls off a wall so my point is we think it's technology it's rapsodo it's spin rates it's training bats it's training balls in reality we there's so many simple ways for us to get repetition and to compete but yet we feel that we're not keeping up with our neighbors because we need that name on our jersey. Yeah, I play for the Rough Riders and the, they're the elite national prospect team. And, you know, they've sent so many guys and their website is littered with Division One student athletes. And then I will say to parents, if we just do the game of musical chairs and we recognize it on any given year in totality at the, all levels of college baseball, there is only going to be between 10 and 15,000 roster spots that 100 to 150,000 seniors are trying to find their way to. The numbers are not in your favor. And we're, but yet we're told that all these boys that play travel baseball, they're going to play in college because all of our guys play in college. It's a lie. It's not the truth. And you don't find out until you get to the end of the road and they say, well, I'm sorry, but you know, your son is too old. We don't have an 18U team. And, you know, we tried, but he just never got any better. You have no recourse. You have no recourse. And I will tell you, it happens to about 70%. That's being conservative of all, all boys who start playing travel baseball at the age of eight and they get to 17. And in those nine or 10 years, it just doesn't happen. But yeah, look at the money you spent. Did you have fun? Did your son have fun? That's the question you have to ask yourself. It's it's definitely a balancing act. I get the the nature of it is like you want to enjoy those years. You want to play as many games as you can. And I mean, let's be real. Practice doesn't really happen. You know, it's 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 largely competitive and not necessarily developmental. And, and so it, it, it lines up with exactly what, what Corb said. 
Well, if you think about it, Eric, and, and I get a lot of parents and I get a lot of travel ball friends that push back. And I say to them, oh, you played 60 games. How many of those were full seven inning games? How many of those were an hour and a half time limit games? How many at-bats did all these guys get? How many innings did any of these kids get? How many ground balls did any of these kids get? Because we're competition heavy and we're practice light. That's not a baseball development model. That's a, hey, we played all the games that we said we were going to play. We might have only gotten three or four innings in on about half of those games. And you're a pitcher that went two innings and another pitcher went two innings. How am I learning to go through a lineup two and three times if I'm only pitching two innings? How am I learning as a hitter how to face velocity when the team we're playing only has one guy that throws 82? How is that preparing me for college baseball? So my point is, is we can tell people that you're going to get this level of instruction and this, you know, this level of competition. I can't control competition of other teams. I can't control mother nature. I can't control uh, my repetitions, my ground balls, my fly balls in the travel ball world. I just can't. So my repetition, go to any college practice. I absolutely tell parents that when I look to come to work with me, first thing I got to do is talk to your son. I need to look him in the eyes. If he looks me in the eyes and I see there's a passion and a love for the sport, we're going to work together. But when I talk to boys and I say, who's your favorite team? Um, uh, well, what about favorite player? No, they don't really have one. You're 16 years old. You're on an elite national prospect team. You don't have a favorite player. Do you know how to keep a scorebook? How many reps do you get as a catcher? What are you doing for blocking drills? What are you doing for throwing drills? Uh, well, we don't really practice a lot. Well, when you get to college, uh, that whole practice thing, yeah, it's about to get very real very quick, and it's going to be very intense, and it's not a high school practice. So when do we want to learn that? When do we want to know that? It's not easy. It's hard. You know, catching bullpens. I actually had a young man tell me he doesn't catch bullpens. It, it, he's too hot. Okay, you try that in college. You know, you, let's see how far that's going to get. And this kid played on a national travel baseball team. He doesn't catch. I leave that to other catchers. I don't do bullpen. I just come back to, um, you know, reps matter. You know, like you need to get them. Um, and, and, you know, what's, what's wild about it is, is our floor facility, um, I'm always shocked at how busy our hitting coaches in, in the private sector are during the season. And the reason is very simple. A lot of our really good players come and hit between 7 and 9 p.m. on weeknights because they go to practice and they don't feel like practice is sufficient for getting them the, the quality reps they need because there's, you know, there's 25, 30 kids on a team. So they need to go and get their extra reps. And I actually respect it a lot, especially knowing they're doing it in the middle of a school year and they have to be really organized with their academics to get it in. But it it's a reality. And what's what's really interesting on the pitching side of things, and this, you know, this happened in the years after Tyler obviously moved on to college and the professional baseball, but it's amazing how little these, these, these pitchers actually pitch, you know, they're, they're at a, a big time showcase event or whatever it may be every week, but they're going out and they're, they're throwing one inning and gassing it out. Like you actually go and look at their innings count over the actual summer. And, and there's guys that play for, for two and a half months, but only throw 22 innings. Well, I can tell you definitively the, model of summer baseball that we currently have for those guys that do end up on a college campus and i you know naia juco uh, division three division two II, division one what have you fall baseball is intense and the number of repetitions that you're going to take as a pitcher or a catcher or a position player is unlike anything you've ever had in your life now when do you want to know that your arm better be ready to rock and roll in August or September. I mean, I remember that hit Tyler over the head like a sledgehammer because he was in football mode. You know, he was just, hey, every year in August, I play football. But we think travel baseball is this long, exhaustive summer. Yeah, travel-wise it is, but repetition-wise, it's not. And so, you know, we think, oh, well, we're going to get our, our 30 innings in high school and and we'll get our, our innings in the summer. I got to get ready for summer. I don't really care about high school. I got to be ready to, for the showcase and, you know, going through Georgia or Florida or Indiana, where, wherever I got to go in the summer. And all they're trying to do is hump up a fastball. Well, if you don't learn about sequencing, if you don't learn about tunneling, if you don't learn how to pitch when you don't have a breaking ball that 
day or a good feel for a change up that day, you're going to get crushed. You're not ready to compete at the college level. And the other thing that we're, we, we are all told is 90 miles an hour is, is the answer, right? If I can hit a baseball that comes in at 90, if I can throw a baseball at you know, 90 miles an hour, I am going to be a star. Well, a newsflash, I coached at Becker College. I had five guys that threw 90. And I'm talking, we played Riviera, schools that parents have no idea about, small, small Division three schools, and their nine hitter was turning around 92 like it was on a tee. My point is, the only way to learn in this sport is through repetition and failure. You cannot learn what it looks like, feels like, sounds like until you're actually in the heat and you're actually getting lit up or you're actually putting an 0 for 3 up and you've got to come up with the bases loaded and two outs and the guy on the mound is really good. Okay, you got to you got to shake off the 0 for 3. We need you right here. But we don't see that at, at the travel level. Uh, at least we don't see it consistently. I guess I'll be, I'll be fair and say we don't see it on a regular basis. So when you talk about, you know, some of these like ideal plans, right? Do you, do you have age specific guidelines for kids? I know we touched on a little bit like the 13 to 15s, but you know, like I know you, you have a big passion for kids under the age of nine, like making them fall in love with the game. It's like, you know, do, do you have key considerations maybe for below nine, 10 to 12, 13 to 15, 16 to 18, and then college. What are the, what are the competencies that, that parents need to focus on to, to get on the right path? If I was made commissioner of the sport <laughs> for one day, and I was able to make rules that it would be in existence for at least a year, prior to the age of 10, we, are, we lead parents to believe that everything their sons or daughters do with on a softball or baseball field from, from basically T-ball age of five is going to matter with regard to making a varsity baseball team or playing in college. I don't know why or where that came from, but I have a newsflash. Nothing your child does prior to the age of 14 has any relevancy as to whether he's going to play college or play high school baseball for that matter. So I would make sure we have every team named after a major or minor league team. Everybody has to play and have a logo on their chest for the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Pirates, um, the Mudcats, just give them a team, give them somebody to root for, give them a hat, give them a jersey, and let's go out and just play fun. Let's just have some fun. I don't – 8U, 6U rankings and travel ball teams and tryouts for 7U and 9U, ridiculous. Now, Little League as an entity, I believe strongly in up and through the age of 12. Why do we want to rush children to be older? Enjoy Halloween. We should be focused on Halloween, trick-or-treat, Santa, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy. We shouldn't be worried about a travel team's rankings at nine years old. And is your son advanced and elite for a nine-year-old? That's silly. It's silly. Another newsflash. For decades, absolute decades, almost a century, 10-year-olds faced 12-year-olds. And they were nervous and they were scared. But when they got to be 12 years old, they had confidence. Why do we take those levels away? that children earn. It's like when you're 10, you're just playing against an 11 or 12 year old. You can't wait to be a 12 year old. And then you get to be 12 and you get to be, you strut around like you're the big guy on the team and you have confidence and you believe in yourself. And you know what? That can help as they make that jump to 13 through 15. You get to be 13, that big diamond, it's intimidating. And I didn't lift a lot of weights at 13 years old. But what I learned was I couldn't reach second base in the air as a catcher. I had to keep throwing and throwing and throwing. I had to learn how to use my feet. I had to learn how to use my body. I had to learn how to turn my body properly. But I learned by watching older players. We have taken away the spirit of the sport all in the name of business. To be a 13-year-old and to compete against 14 and 15-year-olds, guess what? Those are the guys you're going to be competing with at the high school level. When do you want to learn that? At that age or when you actually have to be ready at the high school level to be a JV or varsity player? 13 or 15, learn the game. That's when the rubber hits the road. you got to learn the nuances of the, the game when you have a three-to-one lead and a runner on first and a ball in a gap and I'm an outfielder. i got to keep that guy the the hit it, the batted runner. I got to keep him off second base. 
those are the things that are lacking in the sport right now. So 13 to 15, I'd make it absolutely just like the 10 through 12, compete against older players. The next rule I would make is I would tell every single parent, 15 years old, that's the time. You want to play travel baseball? Go play travel baseball, but make sure that your sons want to play college baseball. If you're doing this all in the name of college, do you know how much it costs to go to college? Now, there, there may be some rule changes. That's a story for a different day. But as it presents itself right now, college baseball gives out fractions of scholarship. I don't know why we call them scholarships, because to be honest with you, a scholarship is academic money. You're getting a scholarship to be a scholar. And, and the basketball and the football, they have full scholarships for four years guaranteed. Baseball is a performance bonus. If you perform, you get to keep this money. But if you don't perform, we can reevaluate and take it away next year. And if you get academic money, that's for four years. So parents, you're spending money and the end game to go to a private school may be 50 to as high as $80,000 and a scholarship may be a fraction of that. And oh, by the way, it's only for one year. So baseball, it needs to get back to the kids. It needs to get back to playing more, competing less. And when I say that, everybody looks at me like I have three heads. Pickup games, sandlot games, wiffle ball games, pinky ball, tennis ball, go play baseball on a sandlot. Drop your kids off, leave, and they'll be okay. They'll find their way, I promise you. But go let them play. Don't worry about them competing with an umpire and another team that is filled uh, with Gatorade buckets. Go let them drink out of a water hose and let them go play and let them take a ball off the side of the head if that <laughs> is what happens. But they'll be okay. But they have to play more, compete less. They have to throw more and pitch less. And they have to swing more and hit less. And if we did that, baseball would be reborn in, in this country. I'm curious as you as you kind of went through this, one thing that we haven't really hit on that is is the big money maker in the industry. And there's, you know, don't get me wrong, there's success stories, but I think on the whole, we we both know what what we're really getting. We we talk about showcases, right? Like where where do these fit in? Um, I know you're a big advocate of, of college camps, like attending, you know, potential places where you might like to go to school, use it as a visit to the campus and attend. I know that was big for Tyler with Vandy. Um, like what's your, what's your take on the, the, the industry of showcases and, and is there a place for them? Short answer. I don't like showcases. I've never liked showcases. I have participated in showcases. Showcases are where, we're basically taking, if we have 100 students, we're going to see 90 average and we're going to see 10 elite or above average. The 10 above average, we've probably, they've already been identified very, very few times. Does anybody come out of, you know, thin air or space? Um, a showcase, if, if you have a plus tool or an advanced tool, you run fast, you throw hard, you hit the ball far, you hit the ball consistently, you field the ball very, very well. Okay, a showcase is going to help. But at its core, the essence of a showcase is to put your skill sets on display so college coaches can make a decision. If I told you that college coaches now, they don't want the show ponies. They want to see when the lights are on and the scoreboard's on. If I told you that more coaches now want to see in a competitive environment failure. They want to see you fail. They want to see you with the bases loaded and the shortstop made an error and you got a one run lead. How are you going to compete against a three, four hitter? Um, they want to see when you strike out with the bases loaded, are you going to get up and be a top of the rail guy and cheer on the guy that you know, hopefully he picks you up and gets the base hit and your team ends up winning, or are you going to throw your helmet in and slam it down a showcase is a 60 yard dash. It's a throw from right field. It's five swings in a cage or a turtle. Now it's becoming put a ball on a tee with a gun in front of a screen and show me your exit velocity. Um, it, it, it's, it's a much different world that is more for the advancement of paying volunteer coaches and putting money in travel organizations pockets. You know, these showcases and these, uh, these clinics um 
you know, I always tell parents, go to a camp to get more bang for your buck. Well, why is that? Because the coaching staff is going to actually teach, talk, and be a part of your son's uh, time. A showcase is very little interaction with anybody. You get a t-shirt with a number on the back. They herd you in. It looks like a herd of cattle all go over and start stretching out. And they all start running to do their 60s. And then they all start to get their gloves and warm up their arms so they can field and throw the ball from right field or throw the ball from third base or as a catcher. And then the, the hitters will, will start to take live cuts with, against the pitchers. Uh, and it's just not anything that I think is um, productive for parents or student athletes. Um, college camps, do some homework. Go, go to a Division three, a Division two camp and see what the coaching staffs are like. You'll be amazed. I tell people about Southern New Hampshire all the time. Scotty Luazo does a great job in a Division two school, and he gets just as many players drafted as Boston College, which is an ACC school up the road. It's no knock on Mike Gambino. My point is, is it's not the division that matters to a major league scout if that is your son's dream. What matters is the development of your son's skill sets and the progression of your son's skill sets over a period of time. Do they measure out as your son gets more physically mature, mentally mature? Is his skill sets, are they developing or are they regressing? And so showcases don't get you to the end you know, the end game out of a showcase is extremely limited. Whereas the end game coming out of a camp, if you talk to 10 college coaches, all 10 will tell you that it, there is a definitive certain percentage of student athletes on their rosters, both formerly and currently, that came from their camps. But if you ask them if they came from, you know, the elite prospect showcase camp, no, not that I know of, no. Camps matter. Showcases, not so much. Now, in, in that same vein, obviously, you know, there, there are places where it's useful to allocate resources, maybe places where it's not, right? We've, we've seen people who drop, you know, 1200 bucks in a showcase and then spend two grand to, to fly to it and stay at a hotel and all that stuff. Where, where else do you see money wasted the most in, in, in the, you know, this kind of baseball development realm? Anything that happens in January, anything that's happening December, January, or February as a showcase or a tournament is a money grab. There's nothing that can be done. And the college coaches do not go to those events. It's either a quiet period. It's either, you know, a, a dark period. Um, I don't know why parents want to spend money during the months of December through February, but yet here we are. I have 13 year old team that from New Hampshire that went to a MLK tournament, in Fort Myers, Florida. I'm sure the hotels were happy. I'm sure the umpires were happy. And I'm sure the travel uh, coordinators uh, who ran the event were happy. But the boys who had sore arms that lingered into April and May, they're not so happy. The wasted money is spent on showcases, on any baseball-related event after October. I don't think there's any need to be involved in any camp or clinic or showcase from October through the end of high school. You should be focusing on your high school program. If we spent more time with skill set development, and when I say that, I mean that as balls off of a wall. You know, you can learn pitch grips by playing catch. You can take a million reps on your own in a cage. You can, you know, take, you know, the hitting lesson and the pitching lesson, I always believe is best if you've been working as an individual and you want to get some refinement from an experienced coach or player, but that shouldn't be your, your bulk work. That should be your, your polish work. Money should be spent on strength conditioning. It should, and it should really be spent in a program that is truly preparing your son for the college experience, both as a student and as a student athlete. And by that, I mean, when you're, a college athlete. It is a business. That coach owns you. That school owns you. They own your time. At what point have we as a model taught time management? We haven't. But time management is a separator. It is a massive separator. 
how to spend your time, how much sleep is needed, how much study is needed, how much work is needed, how much social life is needed. But yet we play all these games, we drive all over the place and we, we go from one game to the next and we, we look back and we didn't get any workouts in, we didn't hydrate, we didn't sleep, you know, we didn't learn how to, how to live with a roommate, we didn't learn how to get up early and eat properly to prepare for our games that day. I mean, who in their right mind wants to play four games in one day as a tournament? I mean, at <laughs> what point does this, where does the insanity stop? So my point to parents is at 14 years old, and if your son looks you in the eye or 15 years old, and your son says to you, dad, mom, I really want to play college baseball. It's important to me. It's something that I really want to do. I always say to parents, you have to have a plan at that point that mirrors what a college program looks like. Maybe it doesn't have to be as intense to start, but by the time they're juniors, are they getting up in the morning? Are they getting the cat? Are they getting the food, the nourishment that they need? Are they preparing themselves to be ready for that day's activities, both in a classroom, on a baseball field, in a weight room? Uh, are they being taught how to be a teammate? Are they te being taught how to be, uh, how to excel at the role that they're given? You know, that's the one thing I tell parents all the time. Your son's a shortstop today. He could be asked to become a catcher tomorrow. Is he going to try and prepare to learn that position for the good of the team, to help the team? Or is he going to kick and scream and say, I'm a shortstop. I'm not going to be a second baseman. I'm not going to be a third baseman. Um, those are the things that you should be spending time, resources, is learning what the process looks like at those higher levels and begin to e allow your son to immerse himself in the structure, in the routine, and the disciplines that it's going to take to be a college student athlete. You nailed it there. Um, so, you know, let's let's maybe speak to the college recruiting process. And this is could, this could be a a podcast in and of itself. Um, so maybe maybe that's a sequel we'll do down the road. But you know, what are the common mistakes that you're seeing? Obviously, we talked about you know spending money on the wrong things and all that. But you know, even just in terms of how you know families and players position themselves in the eyes of some of these college coaches, what what works, what doesn't? What are the mistakes that you see as you you, you communicate with families on this front? I think the biggest mistake that I deal with on a daily basis is parents trying to keep up with the friends the teammates uh they look around and they see so and so just committed to the university of mississippi and he's a 2025 well my son's better than him well that doesn't matter it doesn't matter somebody made a decision and a college commitment from a student athlete we all remember i'm sure you remember without mentioning names a student athlete from massachusetts committed to an sec school as a freshman uh, and then as it got closer to the students, uh, junior and senior year, the school basically said, we, we didn't offer a scholarship. We don't have a scholarship for that young man. We don't need to rush the process. A 14 or 15 year old who doesn't remember what they had for dinner last night, they don't know who they want to take to their junior or senior prom, but yet we want them to make a decision that is a 40 year decision, not a four year decision on where they want to attend college. What do they want to major in? I don't know. Uh, well, are you interested in math, science? I really don't know. Uh, well, what do you know about the coaching staff? Do you know the, the head coach's first name? Yeah, uh, it's Tim. Well, what's his wife's first name? I don't know. Who's the pitching coach? I don't know. So my point is, is that we are trying to get students to think or believe that they have to be making a college decision before the end of their sophomore year of high school, when in reality, coach to a man would tell you they're slowing the processes down they want these students to be more engaged more accountable more proactive visit college campuses do you want a rural campus a major metropolitan city do you want a large campus do you want a small campus what type of facilities amenities how close this was the best one i ever got i had a young man from louisiana he was dead set on going to Columbia University. And I said to the dad, man, that is a great school, Ivy League school. Congratulations. I, said, I have to ask you a question. I said, have you ever visited campus? No, sir. We did a, we did a uh, virtual tour. This was before COVID. 
I said, well, that's not going to quite cut it. I said, because, you know, Columbia, you know, you live in a rural area of Louisiana, you, you hunt and you fish and, and you, you know, go up for mud bugs and crawfish. I said, Columbia is right in the heart of the city. I said, you really should take a tour. Moral of the story, didn't take the tour, showed up on campus, didn't like the campus, was out of there within six weeks. And so take the time to visit a college campus, walk around the campus, see the student life, see the student activity. Where is the dorm as it relates to the ballpark? Why is that a big deal? Well, you had a Sunday game and you just took a 10 hour road trip. The bus got into the field to drop you off at the locker room at 2 a.m. You have an 8 a.m. class and your dorm is a mile and a half walk, and you have to carry your bags or your books or whatever you're carrying back to your dorm. Not a lot of fun. Make sure you know where the library, where the cafeteria is. You have to feel the campus. Does it feel right for you? Is it a right fit? Baseball is the same at every college. Every college, their campus is very, very different. And so you have to understand what the social activities are. And so I think as a whole, with regard to college recruiting, too much emphasis on baseball, not enough emphasis on the four-year college experience or the 40-year decision of the quality of the degree. And so we, as an industry, want to pump Division I. We all want to use these P5, D1, ACC, SEC, you know, and it's the television games and they see the notoriety and the social media accolades and the validation. Well, Valdosta State or Georgia Southern, they don't get anybody that talks about them. Or Southern New Hampshire, I've never heard anybody get a NIL deal from, you know, Southern New Hampshire. And so what we're doing is we're promoting the hype and we're not providing the substance. And the substance is, not only the classroom, but it's the quality of the experience. You're going to meet your potential. You're going to meet your future spouse, your future best man at your wedding. Those people that you surround yourself during your college years tend to be more a part of your life than your high school friends. And so do you want to pick a school that you're going to be proud to say that you're a graduate from? Or do you want to say, yeah, I just played baseball. Uh, at such and such a school, and I really didn't play. So the recruiting process is about the college experience in its, in its entirety. It's not about the baseball experience. And so we're in a rush to make a decision to commit. We have to commit. Everybody wants to commit. I'm blessed and I'm going to continue my academic and athletic career at this school. And I want to be able to blast it all over social media. And I want to be able to pin it up on my social media walls and platforms. That decision is life altering. We spend more time thinking about what we want to post on social media than we do where we want to go to college. And so the whole process of travel baseball, the narrative is we get kids to division one, we get kids to college baseball, we get kids to the next level. The next level is the last frontier of your child's you know, youth because it gets very real with these student loans. You know, you go to school, you go to baseball and you pick a 50,000. I have a young man that's at Fordham. They gave him a 60% scholarship and he's still gonna have a six figures of student debt when he graduates. And the price of college is only going up, but we went to that school because the baseball coach really liked us. So we need to spend more time understanding what happens after baseball is done. How am I maximizing my opportunity in college to be a better provider as a parent, as a, as a future head of a, a household? And where is my career path? What are my opportunities going to be? Because baseball is going to end for probably 95 to 97% of every college student athlete at all levels. What are we going to do then? What's, what's the game plan then? And so, when I'm working with parents, we're trading athletic ability for academic excellence. And academic excellence to me, I'm considered an uneducated man. I can get a beer and a bag of chips because I got drafted by the Cubs. You say my name in Fitchburg, they say, oh, he was a good baseball player. You say Tyler's name, 
Oh, he went to Lawrence Academy. He went to Vanderbilt. And that's just an example. Kyle, he went to LSU Eunice and LSU Alexandria. He has an associate's degree and he has a bachelor's degree. They're educated men because of baseball. They will be able to provide for their families and have a quality future on whatever level that they choose, but they have the foundation of being an educated man. That is the process. I, I love it. And, and it's also the, the name of the new book, which uh, I was fortunate to get an advanced copy of. It's, it's absolutely outstanding. Um, you know, I was joking before we came on air that I've, I've heard so many pearls of wisdoms and, you know, been part of so many conversations you've had with, with kids and with parents over the years and reading the book, it was cool to see all of them, you know, in one place, you know, where it's a, a really organized resource. So hopefully we can you know, send people to this podcast, but obviously also the book, it's called The Process. Um, the subtitle is A Family's Guide to Developing College Ready Recruits from Little League Through High School. Um, definitely an, an outstanding read um, and a wonderful investment that I'd, I'd recommend to, you know, really any uh, parents and kids that are listening to this who are, you know, whether it's a nine-year-old or a 16-year-old or, you know, even some college families that may be, you know, participating in this podcast. I think it's um, important info that everyone should hear. Also, people need to give you some love on Twitter. Um, it's at BaseballLifer11. Um, you guys do a great job with we're on like Twitter Twitter chats with, with various coaches and you know folks in the baseball development world and um, you know just really delivering a, a great amount of value to the baseball community and I, I respect it and it's it's living up to the hype is the most passionate baseball guy I've ever met so um, can't can't sing your praises enough in this regard. Well, I appreciate that, Eric, very very much. I really I've had a great a great time as always. Uh, I learn every time I speak with you on a variety of different levels. Um, and one of the one things I do want parents to understand is I get asked why the book. I believe in 2009, you said to me, you should write a book. <laughs> you did. And then in, Tim, 2000, Tim Cor in 2011, I, I said it every year. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, and so Tim Corbin, uh, you know, uh, once said to me, uh, you know, once Tyler graduated, he said, geez, man, you, you got some stories to tell. You need to write a book. And, and so I really wanted to take the time to get parents to understand baseball, to me, is a choice. You know, football, if you're big and strong, basketball, if you're tall, hockey, if you're, you know, uh, from Canada or you're a cold weather guy, you gravitate. Baseball is everywhere. It's on all continents. I watch videos from friends that are in Kenya right now. Uh, I see stories from the Dominican Republic and boys playing with cardboard gloves and shoes. It's a sport. And I just came up with June 19th, it's Father's Day, but it should be play catch with dad day, play catch with your grandfather day. It's generational. It's something that every single parent mom, dad, grandmother, grandfather can pass down to their children, to their grandchildren. And to me, it's been lost. We have taken the game away from kids and we've homogenized it and monetized it. And it needs to be given back to families. And more importantly, it needs to be given back to kids. And that's why I wrote the books. You can get to where you want to go and you don't need to spend all the money. It's not the way, it's not the only way. I love it. And uh, and the proof is in the pudding, you know, you, you lived it. So um, Walter, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time and, and sharing your expertise. Again, folks, uh, check out the process. It's, it's an excellent book available on Amazon. I think it's available as a Kindle as well. So, um, you know, can't, uh, can't recommend it highly enough. So um, appreciate you, Walter, and uh, look forward to having another one of these conversations down the road when I'm sure you've got more pearls of wisdom to share. I appreciate it, Eric. And as always, please say hello to Mrs. Cressy and the girls. And I appreciate taking uh, you taking the time to have me on tonight. You got it.